At the time, the world didn't know it, but on December 17th, 1903, it became a smaller place. On that day, the Wright brothers proved man could fly. Hello and welcome to part one of the Village's Media Group's Faces of Freedom. I'm Larry L. Here at Fantasy of Flight, visitors come face to face with aviation history. That's also the purpose of this half hour special. Ever since someone figured out airplanes offered a strategic advantage in battle, brave Americans have used them to fight for freedom. From World War I to the present, it's been a long and distinguished chronicle of airborne achievement, of inspiring performances by both man and machine. And when it came to performance, the B-26 Marauder was as close to a fighter as a bomber could get. In its early development, it was nicknamed the Flying Coffin because of high casualty rates attributed to its short wings and high stall speed. But once modifications were made, the medium bomber ruled the skies over Europe, North Africa, and the Pacific. And in one of those B-26 cockpits was an extraordinary pilot named Fred Mingus. When the perils of war make tomorrow's a precarious proposition, a soldier's least concern is a scrapbook. But for Fred Mingus, combat film shot of him and his plane will forever be a record of duty to country. Inspired by a barnstormer in his hometown, Mingus enlisted in the Army Air Corps in 1941. According to my dad, he says there's three things you want to remember right there. It's keep your eyes open, your mouth shut, never volunteer. Advice he ignored twice, by volunteering for tech school and later by signing up for pilot training after Pearl Harbor. Mingus ended up at the controls of a B-26 Marauder, a plane with a difficult flight profile, but more renowned for its unparalleled speed and survivability. One-tenth of one percent combat losses. It would carry back as much flak as it what took over in bombs. Which is why B-26s were the first wave of aerial assaults on D-Day. It was so uh, overwhelming, uh, a sky full of airplanes and a channel full of boats uh, that uh, you had to know that this was something special. And he got a closer view than anticipated. Bad weather forced his squadron to roar over Omaha Beach at only 1,200 feet. My tail gunner says they're throwing rocks at us. It was about the only thing the Germans didn't throw at the 26. And still, the plane kept coming, even when anti-aircraft fire took out an engine. They said, said it would, wouldn't fly on a single engine. Well, Bumblebee can't fly either, according to aerodynamics, but uh, th that Pratt & Whitney would carry that plane back home by itself. In fact, it did me three times. A trio of marauders Mingus nursed home on single engines before finally crash landing. Days after his final incident, he endured another harrowing flight and told his CEO he'd had enough. And I says, I'm done. I quit. I've finished flying. No more. He says, how many do you have? I said, 65. Nearly three times as many missions as he was supposed to fly. Of the 65, Mingus made 54 without a co-pilot or navigator. Superiority that earned him three distinguished flying crosses and 13 air medals. A legacy of leadership defined by a desire to stand up and stand out. Aside from a little crop dusting in the 50s, Mingus's days in the pilot seat ended when he left the Army Air Corps and walked away from his bomber for the last time. On the subject of bombers, for most of World War II, arguably the undisputed heavyweight champ was the B-17. When the prototype rolled out of the factory in 1935, its awesome firepower prompted a newsman to call it a flying fortress. The name was a perfect fit. The B-17 played a vital role in the bombardment of Germany, and because of the plane's unbelievable ability to withstand damage, it brought many crews safely home. Not all were that fortunate, though. Some, like Joel Gatewood, had to make his way back over land after being shot down behind enemy lines. Megan Burke has his story. August 17, 1943. 21-year-old Army Air Corps Second Lieutenant Joel Gatewood found himself falling out of the sky. We're flying at 19,000 feet, which is uh, lower than what any missions that we'd ever flown before, you know. So consequently, uh, the fighters were able to get into us real, real fast and furious there. 
This would be Gatewood's fifth and final mission behind the controls of his prized B-17 bomber, and it played out like a nightmare. Hit by enemy fire, Gatewood and his crew scrambled for control. I didn't think that there was any way that we was going to get on into the target without uh, some assistance. So I told my, I told my co-pilot then to, uh, to hook up the automatic pilot. I didn't know whether it would work or whether it wouldn't, but I thought it would be a chance anyway. It might have been had a rocket not ripped through the cockpit at that moment, instantly killing the co-pilot and engineer. And then this plane went right into a spin. I lost complete control of it. it was, uh, the controls were knocked out, so the plane's going down into a spin. Left with only one choice, Gatewood and his crew prepared to jump. Before I, was, before I bailed out, there I got out of the seat and was standing back of it. And I, I suppose uh, hundreds of things went through my mind. And at first I was thinking about my family and how they was going to take it, you know, because I didn't figure I was going to get out of there anyway. Jumping to survive, three of his 10 crew members followed. They spent 10 days on the run in German territory before facing 21 months in a prison camp. The memory is still vivid. Gatewood is quiet about his days as a POW, but not about his fondness for the sky. I would have gone back. I would have, in fact, uh, so many times I wish that I had stayed in and, and got to fly that B-29. You know, that was the next, that was the biggest plane then we had at that time. See, the 17 was the biggest until the 29 came in, so then, yeah, I would have uh, been glad to fly that 29. Enemy fighter on his tail or not. For Faces of Freedom, I'm Megan Burke. During another mission with a badly damaged plane and no oxygen, Gatewood got his freezing crew back to base. He was awarded the Silver Star. When we come back, we'll introduce you to an airman who kept Allied planes in the air. Stay with us. We'll have more Faces of Freedom in a moment. This portion of Faces of Freedom has been brought to you by these sponsors. Welcome back to Faces of Freedom, America's airborne heroes. A look at the men and women of aviation who have helped make our country free. You know, not all aircraft are designed for destruction, and none are designed to stay aloft indefinitely. That's because these aircraft engines need fuel. So valuable support planes can make the difference between success and failure. Credited with saving lives and preserving missions, in-flight refueling tankers prove to be lifelines in the sky. Here's Mark Giblin with the story of Bob Matthews. Words that are all too familiar to Bob Matthews. During his 20-year enlistment in the United States Air Force, Matthews was a boom operator aboard the KC-135, refueling other combat aircraft in flight, using a boom about 80 feet long and precisely finding the refueling door on the fighters, a job critical for the success of air attacks during the Vietnam War. We take off in perspective time with the fighters, and we'd post pre-strike them. So that way they could take off with a lot heavier bomb load and not quite as much fuel. They get airborne, we top them off, they'd go to their target. Disconnect on my count of three. One, two, three. Disconnect. Have a good trip. The sound of a successful refueling, but not all went this smoothly. During some missions, the prospects were not good. A lot of times, they needed us badly. They'd holler for a tanker because they were either shot up or their fuel was down and stuff like this. And we'd go to wherever we had to within reason to get them and bring them home. And we saved a lot of them. We saved a lot of them. When that didn't work, Matthews and his crew did the only thing they could to help save their fellow comrades. When a guy gets hurt up that bad, we have to tow him in what you actually do, keep the boom hooked up to it. Now, you're not really pulling them with the boom, but you're being right there to guide them along and give them fuel. They would get close enough to base, disconnect, and the fighter would glide in safely. With Matthews' 113 combat missions, three air medals, and the combat readiness medal, there are plenty of fighters who owe their safe return to him and his crew. You were proud, there's no question about it. You were proud that you helped somebody come back in and you're doing the job that you were uh, 
trained to do. Bob Matthews was deployed to Vietnam four different times from 1966 to 1972, each time doing what he was trained to do and often going above and beyond the call of duty. For Faces of Freedom, I'm Mark Giblin. At his busiest, Matthew says as many as 40 aircraft in close proximity would be lined up for a refill. And to make his job even more dangerous, he also flew night missions. Matthew says refueling in complete darkness was a true test of both skill and nerve. Now the same can be said for just about any job involving aircraft combat operations, which put a premium on training. Even though the best way to learn is by doing, when dealing with high speed, high risk maneuvers in expensive airplanes, that philosophy isn't always the most prudent which is why many aviators owe a large debt to simulator instructors like Jane Lowry. Rebecca Underwood explains. America joined a world at war after Japanese bombs decimated Pearl Harbor. And like many young Americans, Jane Lowry continued a family tradition by joining the military. My father definitely wanted to get back in, but he didn't know it at the time. He had cancer, and nobody was telling him. So I joined up in the Navy. When she was only 19, she became an instructor at a base in Corpus Christi, Texas. It was her job to make sure pilots knew how to handle adverse flying conditions. They could train anywhere from six to eight weeks, depending on how they reacted. Jane was a link trainer instructor. Pilots would get into a simulator similar to this one and listen for audio clues on how to land in low visibility areas. They come to a place where they have to land and you guide them in with dots and dashes. And if it goes dit da, dit da, dit da, and if, it, if that dit da changes at all, then there's something wrong. Based on those sounds, the pilot would lift, drop, or straighten the nose of the plane. And to make sure the instructors practiced what they preached, they had to demonstrate their own skills once a month. And the first time I went up, I wasn't paying a bit of attention to the dit does. All I was thinking about was, keep your nose up, keep your nose up. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I was getting all kinds of flack from the young man who was flying the plane. Jane was enlisted for three years, and she remembers the day the announcement was made, the war was over. Lots of cheers and hurrahs, and when can I go home? After the war, Jane went home, got married, and had two sons. Although she wishes she could have kept in touch with some of her old colleagues, she remembers her days in the Navy fondly. Of course I would do it again. Absolutely I would do it again. Reporting for Faces of Freedom, I'm Rebecca Underwood. During her three-year naval career, Lowry trained more than 2,000 pilots. Still to come, America at war, as seen through the eyes and pictures of Harold Kassar, when the Village's Media Group's presentation of Faces of Freedom continues. This portion of Faces of Freedom has been brought to you by these sponsors. Welcome back to Faces of Freedom, America's Airborne Heroes. I'm Larry L. You know, modern news gathering has spoiled us. The immediacy of satellite technology has transformed war coverage from still photographs into a live, real-time event. But we couldn't tell many of our stories without those priceless black and white pictures. War photography began back in the mid-1800s with the French Revolution and continues today with the war in Iraq. And thanks to intrepid war photographers like Harold Kassar, putting his life on the line at the front line allowed him to capture those snapshots of history. Stephen Reynolds has his story. When Harold Kassar wants to remember, he sometimes finds himself in Veterans Memorial Park. Here he can reflect on the contribution he made during World War II. But he has another way to recall his courageous duty to country. This is P.T. Barnett, a uh, uh shipmate of mine who was shot down. This photo book tells the life and dangerous times of the USS Saratoga. More than the words, the pictures transport Harold. He can remember specific moments in time because he captured them with his camera. I was pretty a pretty good photographer, really, uh, at the time. 
I, I really took a lot of pride in my work. A freelance photographer before he was drafted, his camera work caught the eye of a commanding officer, especially experience he had taking aerial photos, more strategic than artistic. Most of the aerials were patrols. We worked for submarines, you know, stuff like that. But then there were times when we, uh, we actually had engagements in combat. Stuffed into the radio compartment of a TBM bomber equipped with a camera instead of a gun, they'd take enemy fire and Harold would shoot back. Did you ever think you weren't coming back? Yeah, many times. In fact, I'm the only photographer that has flown in combat off the Saratoga that did come back. He had his share of close calls, the closest coming not in the air, but on the ship. I remember this plane coming in. Uh, and I knew damn well it was gonna, it was a kamikaze. After barely surviving the suicide attack, Petty Officer First Class Kassar collected himself and did his duty, resulting in some of the most stunning photos he ever took. You wouldn't know Harold's work to see it. The credit reads simply, U.S. Navy photo. To this day, that's just fine with this unsung hero. But that was all right, too. I wasn't looking for glamour or glory. I just wanted to get back alive. <laughs> get back alive, that's all. Harold went on to a successful career as a professional photographer. Coming up, flying in the military, it runs in the family for Tom Rogers. That story and more when Faces of Freedom continues. This portion of Faces of Freedom has been brought to you by these sponsors. Welcome back to Faces of Freedom, the village's media group's tribute to the men and women who took to the air to help preserve our country's freedom. Tradition is as much a part of the United States Armed Forces as the uniform itself, and generations of Americans have family trees that share branches with the military. Tom Rogers' family has a long and rich military history of its own, and as Christy Neschenfelder tells us, it's the youngest generations of the family who fell in love with flight. You were young. A father and son sharing memories. These old pictures tell the story of four generations of Rogers in the military, starting in World War I. Tom Rogers Jr. began his Army career in Vietnam in civil affairs. We did the psychological warfare leaflet drops. We did the loudspeaker missions. Uh, we did all of those things in support of the ground troops. Then there's his son, Chris, who's continuing the tradition, but this Rogers has his head in the clouds. Just uh, ever since I was a little kid, just always wanted to fly and do crazy things like that. Tom says his son's graduation from the Air Force Academy was one of his proudest moments. And when the, the Air Force Thunderbirds flew over and the caps went up in the air, just sent chills down your spine. The funny thing is, my dad, when I, well, I decided that I wanted to fly C-130s, you know, he kind of got a smile on his face because the Army thinks there are only two planes in the Air Force inventory, either A-10s or C-130s. And the A-10s are the tank busters, and the C-130s are, you know, kind of like the Angel of Mercy. They take them in, they bring them out, and resupply them with everything they need. So he got a kick out of it. Chris's first flight as an aircraft commander took him into Afghanistan. And at that time, we were doing all-night operations, uh, landing on MVGs, which are night vision goggles, so the airfield's blacked out, the cockpit's blacked out, so you have no lights on the plane, and you're just looking through these little binoculars of the green landscape and uh, landing in there. Chris has also served in Iraq, and most recently in Japan, and he flew a C-130 to help with tsunami relief. And you're self-sufficient, and you're helping people, and you get immediate feedback is to what you're doing and it, there's no more satisfying job than that. But for this family, sacrifice is not just a tradition, it's a way of life. You know, it's just the way I was raised. Um, some people are probably different, but I think the call to arms or the call to serve your country is one of the highest things you can do. A lot of people talk and complain, very few people do, and to me, I want to be someone who does. Uh, I want to be someone who helps others. A tradition that promises to live on. For Faces of Freedom, I'm Christine Eschenfelder. Chris began his next adventure recently as he headed to Little Rock, Arkansas as a flight instructor. He'll be teaching young pilots how to handle the C-130. 
When Faces of Freedom continues, we'll meet an aviator who was shot down and spent more than two months getting back to safety. Stay with us. We'll have more in a moment. This portion of Faces of Freedom has been brought to you by these sponsors. Welcome back to Faces of Freedom, America's Airborne Heroes, as we continue to bring you the men and women who flew and fought to keep our nation free. With America fully engaged in World War II, the United States wanted a bomber that could travel farther and faster than the B-17 and carry twice the bomb load. So the B-24 bomber was born, and with it came a lot of firsts. The Liberator was the first bomber with a nose wheel and the first mass-produced airplane. William Harris was aboard a B-24 on D-Day, and as Jessica Kiss reports, that was just the beginning of his harrowing story. April 1944, Army Air Force First Lieutenant William Harris Jr. barreled his B-24 through flak so thick you could almost walk on it. Mission number one successfully completed. Two months later, the 24-year-old pilot was briefed on his 26th and what would prove final bombing mission. Especially if the target was up in Germany or like Pulaski, you could hear a pin drop. And silence did fall on that June 6, 1944 briefing. The target, Plesti, Romania, a city heavily defended by German gunners because of its large oil supply. We lost an engine prior to the, that day in bombing Plesti. We lost one to mal just malfunction. And we were able to stay on with this group and bomb the target. But when we come off, we got hit with enemy aircraft and they shot out another engine. And the German fighters see that that one engine's out. You're the target. So they got another engine. With three of the four engines out, Harris ordered his nine crew members to bail out. As the pilot, Harris was the last to jump. None of my crew ever seen me my parachute open, so they didn't think I ever got out. We parachuted right out into a contingency of the Serbian army in Yugoslavia. Chetniks, as they were called, not only safely harbored Harris and the others from the Germans, but they got word to the 15th Air Force, ultimately leading to the crew's rescue 66 days later. It was, it was hard on my mother. The war, the war Department declared as soon as I didn't get back from the mission, they declared me missing in action. But for the Harris family, William's safe return did not bring an end to the perils of war. Because I had been missing in 66 days, and then I get back, and then she loses another son. 19-year-old Robert Harris, killed in action in the Pacific, the purple heart given to their grieving mother brought little solace. She probably took it the hardest to anybody. You had called him the true hero. Oh, sure. Gave his life, and he did it voluntarily. He wasn't drafted. Just like William, who served, lived, and will always be one hero of an aviator. Reporting for Faces of Freedom, I'm Jessica Kiss. William Harris remained an Air Force Reservist until 1968. The men and women that you just met are only a few of the faces to whom we owe our freedom. There were many others who stepped into harm's way in the name of liberty. And here's a look at some more of them. Staff Sergeant Gunnar Nystrom, who spent three and a half years in the Army Air Corps during World War II as a propeller specialist for the C-46 Commando. And Air Force Colonel Warren Love, a Vietnam veteran whose 30 years of service saw him in the cockpit of the B-52 bomber, the KC-135 Stratotanker, and the C-119, along with the T-33. William Sieber spent 12 years in the Navy as a lieutenant commander. He flew several aircraft, including the AF Guardian and the TVM Avenger, part of an anti-submarine squadron rated best in the Atlantic Fleet. Airman Second Class David Henderson spent four years in the Air Force as a tail gunner on the B-36 Peacemaker and Intercontinental Bomber. Horace France flew on board the PV-1 Ventura while serving in the Navy during World War II, one of his many jobs flying along the coastlines on submarine patrol. Horace was also stationed at a captured German base in French Morocco. Vietnam veteran Jim Bennett achieved the rank of warrant officer during his time in the Army flying the L-19 bird dog over front lines to provide reconnaissance for artillery adjustments. And 28-year Air Force and Air Force Reserves veteran Jack Fell served as a master sergeant with air operations on 10 different aircraft, including the C-130 Hercules, F-86 Sabre, and KC-135 Stratotanker. 
These are just a few more faces who help preserve our freedom. That will wrap up part one of Faces of Freedom. We hope you enjoyed it. Please join us for part two, when we will introduce you to more of America's airborne heroes. Like Jack Jordan, who flew in a B-25 and shot down a Japanese Zero with a 30 caliber machine gun. And Dick Webb, who spent days in the water after being shot down in a TBD Devastator. And the story of the Tuskegee Airmen, our nation's first African-American pilots to ever fly in combat. All this and more in part two of the Village's Media Group's presentation of Faces of Freedom. I'm Larry L. See you then. This Faces of Freedom special presentation was brought to you in partnership by the Villages Media Group, Properties of the Villages, and Comcast.